In the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. In the past month, millions of young Americans graduated, either from high school or from college. And most, if not all of them, were asked the same question. What now? What are your plans? What are you going to do with your life? And it's an important question because the plans they make now will have a big impact on what they experience in the coming months and years. For example, if you ask a young man, what are you going to do now? What are your plans? And he says, well, my plan is to sleep on my friend's couch and play video games and get a part-time job that pays just enough to buy ramen noodles and pay for my Xbox Gold membership. Now, if he says that, you're probably not going to follow up with are you sure you're ready for that? H have you prepared yourself well enough? Are you able to endure that difficult a task? You're not going to say that because not that difficult of a task. However, if you ask a young man what are your plans and he says, I'm going to become a Navy SEAL. Well, then you might want to ask him, do you realize what you're getting into? Does he realize the extent of the training? Does he know about the 24-week underwater demolition training? Is he aware that the, the physical conditioning is a seven-week course and that the first two weeks of those seven weeks are used to prepare candidates for the third week, which is also known as Hell Week? Is he aware that Hell Week consists of five and a half days straight of physical conditioning, and during those five and a half days, he'll run 200 miles, train 20 hours a day, and be allowed a total of four hours of sleep? Does he realize that just one in four young men who attempt to become SEALs actually do? It's important for that young man to understand what he's getting into. I have no idea if any of you plans to be a Navy SEAL, but the fact that you're sitting in a Christian church on Sunday morning tells me that you do plan to follow Jesus Christ. And if you're going to follow Jesus, it's important that you know what you're getting into. Luke's Gospel tells us about three different men that Jesus encountered who wanted to follow him. And Jesus wanted them to understand what that entailed. And Jesus is here this morning. And he wants you and me to understand what it means to follow him. So, you want to follow Jesus. First thing you should know is that it will not always be easy. Luke tells us, As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus did not say, Nope, can't follow me. He didn't say, might as well not try. But he wanted the young man to know it would not be easy. Even though Jesus is the king of kings, he didn't live in a palace. He didn't have people waiting on him hand and foot. In fact, during the three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, he was a wandering rabbi. He often didn't know where he was going to lay his head down at night. He said even... Birds and foxes have a place to live, but I don't. Jesus wanted that man to know it would not always be easy following him. So, you want to follow Jesus. You should know it will not always be easy. It's often uncomfortable because it's not easy or comfortable to be loving in such an unloving world. 
It's not always easy or comfortable to, set, to tell someone that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life in a world that believes that there are so many ways and truths and ways to live. It's not always easy or comfortable to tell your boss, I won't do that because he wants you to do something that goes against God's word. It's not easy or comfortable to tell your friends at the party, I won't do that with you because it goes against God's word. It's not easy or comfortable to tell your boyfriend or your girlfriend, I won't marry you because you don't want anything to do with church and I want a Christ-centered home. So, you want to follow Jesus. The first thing you should know is it will not always be easy. The second thing you should know is that it means setting proper priorities. Luke goes on to tell us that Jesus said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Is this not one of the strangest things you've ever heard Jesus say? I mean, imagine one of your council members coming to Pastor Fix on Sunday morning and saying, Pastor, I won't be able to make the council meeting on Tuesday because my father passed away and we're having his funeral then. Imagine Pastor Fix saying, let the dead bury their own dead. You be at the meeting. I hope you can't even imagine Pastor Fix saying that. So what... Why was Jesus saying it? Well, we're not entirely sure. Luke doesn't give us any background of what was taking place here. It's possible that this man's father was still alive and that what he was saying is, I'll follow you, but later. Or it, it could be that Jesus simply knew this man's heart and knew that he loved his family more than he loved the Lord. What Jesus wanted him to understand is that if you're going to follow me, I am to be your number one priority. And that's what he says to you and me this morning. Jesus is not willing to be number two, number three, or number four on our priority list. He insists that he be the number one priority. And here I think, it's interesting to think about how the devil tries to get people away from Jesus. You know, sometimes he uses very obvious temptations. He tempts them with things that are in and of themselves sinful. That happens, sure. But you know, the devil's a pretty wily fellow. He's been tempting people for a long time, and sometimes he knows he's not going to be able to get us to do things that are obviously sinful. And so what he does is he takes things that are in and of themselves perfectly good and gets us to raise those things above Jesus on our priority list. And then it becomes a problem. Right? Making money is a good thing unless it keeps you from getting closer to Jesus. Okay. Friends are a good thing, unless they keep you from getting closer to Jesus. Hobbies are a good thing, unless those hobbies keep you from getting closer to Jesus. Even family, family is a good thing, unless family keeps you from getting closer to Jesus. I've sadly seen it too many times in my ministry where a Christian slowly but surely got drawn away from Jesus by things that in and of themselves are perfectly fine and good. One young woman that I'm working with right now grew up going to church. She got married in church. She and her husband went to church when they were first married. And now she and her husband and three children haven't been to church in years. And when I inquired what happened or why they stopped going to church, well, just life. You know, I, I work t difficult hours. My husband has a weird schedule. Both of our boys are in baseball and they have games every Sunday. 
You see what's happened? The devil's taken things that in and of themselves are perfectly fine for that family, and he's used those things to draw them away from Jesus. Now, I can't read her heart, and I don't know if she has a relationship with the Lord. When I, when I told her I was concerned about her, she said, oh, no, we pray, and, and all my kids have a Bible. So while I can't read her heart and, and don't know if she still has a relationship with the Lord, certainly she's further from him than she once was. And maybe here I'll just ask if you wouldn't mind including her in your prayers. I won't name her, but he knows who she is, and he'll know who you're talking about when you pray. And just ask that the Lord would bless my words to her and that he would open her heart to remember what is to be her number one priority. So you want to follow Jesus. Remember, it won't be easy. Remember that it means setting proper priorities. And finally, it means not looking back. Luke tells us about a third man Jesus encountered. The man said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And once again, notice what the man wanted to do wasn't a bad thing. He wanted to go back and say goodbye to his family. But Jesus wanted him to understand that when you follow Jesus, it's, you're all in. There's no turning back. And Jesus used a simple illustration. He, he, he said, you think about someone plowing a field and imagine one of those single blade plows pulled by an animal. And if you're, if you're plowing a field, you can't make a straight furrow if you're looking around. It's going to be all crooked. Or a more modern day example, I suppose, is when you're mowing your lawn. Now, I'll admit here to having a bit of OCD. And when I mow the lawn, those lines have got to be straight. And my dad taught me when I was very little, if you're going to make a straight line with the lawnmower, you have to be looking at where you're going. You can't be looking around. Or think of driving your car. You're not going to be able to stay in your lane if you're always looking in the rearview mirror or even worse, looking over your shoulder. You're going to get crooked. Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you're going to be forward focused. You're going to keep your eyes on me and the heaven I won for you. And, and yes, you're still going to enjoy the blessings that come in your life. And yes, you're still going to endure challenges and troubles in your life. But those are going to be ancillary. Those are going to be on the side. You're not going to let those pull you toward your blessings or pull you toward your problems. While those blessings and troubles happen, you're going to stay focused on me and the heaven I won for you. And why? Why? would someone be so focused on Jesus? Because he was so singularly focused on you. You remember how our gospel lesson began? Luke wrote, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Why? Why? Why was that his focus? Because it was Passover and there was going to be a party? Because it was going to be so fun there? No. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem because he knew that was where he was going to be arrested and beaten and bloodied and crucified. And he knew that he had to endure that. Had to endure hell itself if he was going to pay for your sins and my sins, even our sins of sometimes failing to follow him when it's not easy. And those times when we have the wrong priorities, and the times when we look other, elsewhere other than him. Even for all of those sins, he paid the price. His love could do no less. So, you want to follow Jesus then watch him walking to his death for you and follow him right into the heaven he won for you. Amen.
Please stand.